Good morning, church. Welcome to online worship here at Liberty UMC. My name is Arden Ratcliffe Mann, and I serve as one of the associate pastors here at LUMC. And it's my joy to welcome you to worship this morning. I hope you all are having a wonderful Sunday and you're ready to worship God together, though apart, this morning. I want to encourage everyone to sign in, whether this is your first time joining us or if you are longtime members of our community. To do so, if you're joining us live on Sunday morning, you can click on the connection card tab at the top of your screen, or at any time you can go to our website, lumcmo.org slash guest to sign in. Here at Liberty UMC, we exist to be a Christian community where people encounter Jesus and where lives are changed. And that is our prayer this morning, that through some element of our worship service, you will encounter Jesus and that your life will be changed because of it. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship this morning, I again, I always like to ask y'all, take a deep breath, breathe out the worries, the frustrations, the distractions that are going on in your house right now, and breathe in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Pray and ask God to ground you, to help you truly worship God this day. Let us join together in worship. Please join us in our call to worship. Before God spoke the first word of creation, there was love. Before Before anyone anyone entered entered the sanctuary sanctuary this morning, morning, love was was already already here. When we draw our last breath and leave this world, love will be waiting for us. That That love love is God. God. Then Then let let us us worship worship God. God. Amen. Amen. Oh. 
Thanks for joining me for the children's message today. So today we're kicking off our annual giving campaign, which is sometimes called a stewardship campaign. And I wanted to talk to you guys about that word stewardship. Have you ever heard that word? Have you ever heard to be a good steward of something? Being a good steward basically just means taking care of the things you have. So if you want to be a good steward of your toys, you would take care of them. You wouldn't throw them around so that they might break. You wouldn't leave them outside and let them get all wet in the rain or rusty or dirty. You would take care of them. And God wants us to be good stewards of everything God has given us. So that means good stewards of our stuff, but it also means being good stewards of our time, using our time in ways to help other people, using the gifts and talents God has give us, given us to help other people and to do God's work. And that also means being good stewards of our money because we need money, right? We need money to buy food and to buy clothes and to buy fun stuff. But God also wants us to use a portion of our money to help other people. And so this year around this, every year around this time, we have a stewardship campaign where we talk about giving back a portion of our money to God, giving a portion of our money to the church to do God's work, to help people, to help people worship, to help people learn about Jesus. So I just want to encourage you guys, if you get an allowance at home or if you ever make money doing any kind of odd jobs, I want to encourage you to think about how you can be the best steward of your money and maybe think about if you should give a portion of it back to God, give a portion of it to the church or give a portion of it to an organization, a charity that means something to you. Just think about how God might be calling you to use the resources God has given you to do God's work. So let's pray and we'll ask God to help us with that. Dear God, we know that you call us to be good stewards of everything you have given us. Help us to be good stewards of our time, of our talents, and also of our resources, of our money. Help us to remember to give some of what you've given us back to you to do your work in this world. In your name we pray, amen. As we prepare to enter into a time of prayer, please keep in mind all of God's children. But we wanna especially lift up those in our community who are suffering with grief concerns, including Tom and Jody Schaefer and their family in the recent passing of Tom's father. We also wanna keep in mind those with health concerns, including David Bryan, Cam Lawson, and Joyce Fulkerson. Let's go to God in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your At this time, I would like to invite the congregation to join me in a time of prayer. Let us turn our hearts, our minds, and our very souls towards the throne room of heaven. Father God, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, giving thanks, giving praise, giving honor and glory, and with great gratitude on our hearts. We thank you for the ways that you are meeting the needs of those who call themselves members and, and attenders of United Methodist Church here in Liberty. We thank you for the ways that you are using their gifts and their service and their witness to spread the gospel of Jesus throughout the world. We thank you for the ways that you are sustaining and protecting and keeping all of us in your very care. I ask God today that you will be near 
the brokenhearted, that you will bind them up, that you will be close to those who are hurting and suffering and recovering from illness. Um, We think of the many, many people who are struggling with so many maladies in our congregation. God, I ask that you will be the great physician, the healer in their lives. I ask that you will use today's service, the message, the music, everything in it and about it to really help us to visualize and envision what you're calling us to, God. I pray that a spirit of generosity and abundance will arise within us and that we will realize that, God, everything that we have is provided by you from your hand and that your gifts are good and perfect and available to us at all times. I pray that you will indeed show yourself to be the giver of good and perfect gifts to those in need in us and through us and to us today. All this I ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us all to pray this way together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Roads help us do many things. A solid road will elevate us, helping us to see what is ahead. Roads give us traction, secure our footing, and remove obstacles. Although the shape of the local Church of Tomorrow is uncertain, the future of faith is secure. We know that God still wants to connect with people and transform their lives. God will continue to establish communities who walk humbly, do justly, and love mercy. What we need is a road to help us discover our preferred future. Build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. Discover how God wants to connect your faith, your resources, and your Christian community to the future as we embark building the road to what's next. Good morning, and welcome to Liberty United Methodist Church. I'm Steve Klaus, the lead pastor, and I'm so very honored and pleased and and excited to welcome you to our worship this morning. I want to say a special word of welcome to all of our online guests who are joining us through our live streaming and our YouTube experience. Our world is filled with monuments to human achievement. From the Colossus at Rhodes to the Eiffel Tower, humans have constructed towers as testaments to achievement. Surely you have heard of the towering pillars of Stonehenge, But do you know about the Great Polehenge of Gratiot County, Michigan? It's one of the wonders of my wife's hometown. If any of you fancy a trip to Becky's birthplace, Highway 127 North will take you past this quasi-formed structure that has become known to the locals as Polehenge. You see, years ago, a local farmer began work on a pole barn but was unable to finish it. And those poles remain standing in the sky today. Although Becky and I have speculated about what happened, it is clear that a lack of resources contributed. Polehenge has stood for more than 40 years as a monument to the lack of planning and underfunding. Jesus talked often about the cost of discipleship, Join me as I read his story of a tower of futility from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 28 through 33. You can follow along with the Bible app that's located on the screen if you're in our live stream experience. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? 
For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. This is the word of God for all of the people of God today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's scripture captures a scene from a road trip to Jerusalem. Jesus is making his final pilgrimage to Jerusalem and often stops to teach the crowds that are following him. The number of people surrounding Jesus grows every day as his healing and teaching draws more and more people. Luke tells us that large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. This sounds really harsh, but to understand the meaning, we need to know how large these crowds were and why Jesus said what he did. Luke 9 tells us that months before this, after returning from a mission trip, Jesus and his disciples regrouped at Bethsaida. As a narrator, Luke tells us that the crowds found Jesus, the crowds found Jesus at Bethsaida, and he began to teach them. And the disciples are asked by Jesus to feed the crowd, and they are gobsmacked because there are 5,000 men present. Some scholars believe that if 5,000 men were present, we can double and triple that to include both women and children on that scene. From this point onward in Jesus' ministry, Luke tells us that large crowds gathered around Jesus, perhaps even more than 10 to 15,000 who were there at Bethsaida. So Jesus isn't just traveling to Jerusalem with a few friends. When Luke 14 tells us that large crowds had gathered, then Jesus is surrounded by a caravan of people on the road. And as this traveling village of followers presents a problem for Jesus, because Luke tells us that Jesus had already been warned by some Pharisees that there were plots afoot to capture and kill him. If Jesus approaches Jerusalem at the head of a large crowd, there will be violence. Jesus follows his statement about the need for the disciples to hate their family by saying that a true disciple will take up their cross and follow him. The cross was the ultimate symbol of shame in that day. So Jesus is really pushing people away with this teaching. His caustic words are intended to thin out the crowds. He needs dedicated followers, not hangers-on. And Jesus knows what lies ahead in Jerusalem. He knows that those closest to him will run from him and be in danger after his capture. Jesus is trying to keep his death from becoming a physical war so that he can win the spiritual battle ahead for himself and others. Today's scripture finds Jesus telling those same large crowds that each person who wants to follow him should calculate the cost of that decision. He uses two examples to illustrate the concept of counting the cost of discipleship. First, he says that no one would set out to build a tower without examining their finances to see if they have enough funds to complete it. Jesus is referring to the type of tower built for a vineyard. Structures of this type in Jesus' culture often had a stone foundation. And Jesus paints a picture of a person who laid the immovable foundation for a tower only to be ridiculed by their neighbors for the inability to complete it. 
It reminds me of that famous site of Polehenge, which has left generations of savvy Gratiot County farmers scratching their heads. Next, Jesus talks about a king going to war without scouting to determine if they have the military power necessary for victory. And these two illustrations are meant to build on one another. Starting construction without calculating the expense of the project will cost you your reputation. Declaring war without a large enough army will cost you your life. Each of these four illustrations are intended to help Jesus' audience calculate the cost of following him. Jesus wasn't really telling people to hate their family. He was saying that a disciple must love Jesus more than their family. The price of discipleship in the first saying is allegiance. Loyalty must be transferred from family to Jesus. Jesus wasn't telling people that they needed to grab a cross and and carry it with them everywhere. He was saying that they should be identified as a follower of Jesus above all things. The price of discipleship in the second saying is status. But Jesus is also warning us that if we surrender our allegiance and our status to him, discipleship may cost us even more. The price of discipleship in the third illustration is reputation. Followers of Jesus might find themselves branded as a fool for leaving their families for a man who is considered to be a heretic or a criminal. And the final price of discipleship is mortality. Jesus wants those with him on the road to know that if they follow him into Jerusalem, they risk losing their lives. Jesus' stories are meant to paint a vivid picture of the cost of following him. To emphasize this, Jesus closes his time of teaching with these words, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Although the intention of this teaching was to thin out the crowds following Jesus in his time, the message resonates for us today. The theme of this sermon series is building the road to what's next. A wise road builder always looks back to see if the road behind aligns with where they are going. It's important to look back on where we have been as a congregation in recent years and months. For generations now, We have been telling people that if they pray a simple prayer acknowledging their sin and asking forgiveness, they will receive a type of eternal fire insurance. And this message is often combined with the the pursuit of ideals of American success and the casual relationship to the church that Jesus established. And the end product of that theology is a belief that if we pray a little prayer, show up a little, serve a little, and give a little, we can still call ourselves Jesus' disciples. And those concepts of individual discipleship have also informed our idea of what it means to build a church. We start infusing American ideas of customer service and success into that culture of discipleship that asks people to attend and give and serve just a little And if that's the foundation of our church, then we attract people to it by hiring ministry professionals who will help us to attract people through cool programs and clever marketing. As your pastor, I'm saying that this is where we have been in recent years. I know the values and the strategies that most churches have been built on because I used to teach them as a consultant. And as your pastor, I'm repenting of that shallowness. Building on such a foundation cannot support a a vital and healthy church. So what we get is Polehenge. I want to ask you to contrast the message and the methods of the type of Christian religion that has become popular in our day with the stark cost of following Jesus. 
He said, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Jesus is still seeking total devotion of those who call themselves his followers today. I also think it's important to reflect on where we have been in recent months. The global pandemic has had a profound effect on the life of the church and those strategies that we've been using. A warm welcome can't be conveyed with a handshake and a, and a hug anymore. Cool music and hipper sermons are way less important than when they are only one among thousands that are available every day through digital means. And beautiful buildings don't matter much when they're empty. This is where we've been. But we have been able to accomplish some very powerful things in 2020. In many ways, we have not just survived, we have thrived. And the reason I say that is because we've practiced the spiritual discipline of debt reduction. 2020 has been a year to practice that discipline of debt reduction. At this time last year, our congregation owed $3.5 million. By the end of December, LUMC will owe $2.86 million. Thanks to the generous offerings through the Greater Things campaign, we have been able to reduce our overall indebtedness by 18% in just one year. While the discipline of organizational debt reduction has helped to make us great strides this year, there's even more work to be done. If you look at this chart, you can see that the national average for congregational spending on debt is equivalent or equal to 11%, but our church spends 15% of our annual resources on debt retirement. That's 15% after a year of rigorous debt retirement. The cost of carrying that debt also impacts us in very specific ways. A look at this chart will reveal that the average congregation spends 49% of their budget on staff and 11% supporting ministry. By contrast, LUMC spends 46% of our budget on staff and only 6% on resourcing our ministries. Our staff and our church council have been so careful and responsible with the operating budget this year. We've reduced the number of staff and cut back significantly to keep expenses in line with giving and balance the budget. And yet, our debt extracts a toll, keeping us understaffed and our ministries underfunded. Last year, during the Greater Things campaign, I shared my vision of what we could do if we were able to eliminate debt and make more room for ministry. One of those goals was to be able to expand our worship ministry online. And we've been able to accomplish that this year through necessity and some careful spending. I also shared a vision to retrofit and expand the use of all of our campuses, both of them so that they might each be a seven-day-a-week ministry center. In addition to that, I stated that reducing our debt would allow us to hire additional part-time staff to make improvements in the area of hospitality and discipleship and help connect more people with the church. We want to have enough staff to make sure that every person connected to this congregation is fully known, outrageously supported, and equipped to be Jesus' disciples. As we continue to reduce the debt, we need strong giving to our operational budget in order to make that vision a reality. Just as Jesus looked ahead to Jerusalem, we need to discover the road to the future that God has for us and examine the discipleship steps that will help us to build it. To build the road to what is next for LUMC, we need to make some changes as individuals. Jesus is asking us to consider giving up everything for the sake of being his disciples, just as he was on the road to Jerusalem so long ago.
And I believe that the work of building the road to the future begins with asking Jesus where each of us can make deeper commitments to being his disciples. As you reflect on the call to discipleship, I want to encourage you to embrace the discipline of eliminating debt from your personal life. My family and I have been working hard to get rid of all of our credit card debt so that we can be more generous with our church and our community. The cost of discipleship is paid in many different kinds of currency. Some of you may need to redirect your time and your energy to make room to serve more. Others may need to reprioritize personal relationship commitments, and for many, a financial commitment to building the church Jesus came to establish is the next thing God is calling you to consider. The work of imagining the future begins by asking Jesus, what do you want from me, and what is the cost? I also invite you to prayerfully consider the ways that God is calling you to give more of yourself to Jesus. That includes making an estimate of giving for 2021 on the commitment cards that we'll be sharing with our congregation. We will be sharing these cards in the weeks to come in the mail and in our services. I'm confident that God will meet us on the road to the future even as we surrender more of ourselves to Jesus. Would you pray together with me, please? Lord, I ask that you would build your church, that you'd start first with the work of discipleship, that you'd call each of us to a closer, a deeper, a more fulfilling, and a more passionate walk with you. And God, I pray that you'll help us as we examine the resources that you've given all of us because everything comes from your hand. I ask that you'll help us to prioritize the things that help make a difference for eternity, that will build your church, that will build your kingdom here in this community. And I ask that you'll give us wisdom to apportion all of the things that you've blessed us with so that we can be a blessing to others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, friends, and welcome. This year, we decided we wanted to do some uh, interview-style videos for our stewardship campaign. We're so grateful to be here with you. Joining me this morning is John Green, a member of our church council. Say hi, John. Good morning. And Larry Tucker, the chair of our church council for 2020. Good morning. And Leslie Young, our director of operations for the congregation. Nice to see everybody. I want to thank you all for sharing your time. This last year has been one like no other in living memory. Uh, and I thought we should share, John, how did we begin the year financially? Well, in January 2020, Steve, it was clear that our commitments from our campaign fell short of requirements. Hmm. So to achieve a balanced budget and ensure adequate cash flow, we were going to have to reduce expenses. The good news is the council was well on the way in finalizing actions just as the COVID crisis hit. Obviously, COVID, from a financial standpoint, has made things much more difficult for us. Mm. Thanks for sharing that uh, information with us, John, and for your transparency. Um, Larry, you've been with the congregation a while. Does the amount of pledged giving for 2020, did that surprise you? you no, know, not really, because over the last five or 10 years, Liberty United Methodist Church's operating budget has not actually been growing. In fact, when Adjusted for inflation, it's been shrinking a little. You know, when that happens, it limits what we can do in the community. Um, Leslie, you as our director of operations have worked with a team of people and with the council. How have we managed to keep our, our uh, budget balanced this year? Well, to be honest, we were really lucky. Um, we were very fortunate to receive a payroll protection loan from the Small Business Administration. Um, which allowed us to keep our staff employed, um, to continue to make our loan repayments, as well as to um, continue a strong worship program. And we even developed a new online worship program during this time. Yeah, we've been able to do a lot of things. I, I want to take a moment and pause and, and thank Shirley uh, Green, John's wife, uh, and Leslie for their stellar work in helping us to get that payroll protection plan loan. 
Uh, but it doesn't sound like we can count on those methods of fundraising in the future. Uh, so what steps should we be taking in 2021 to help uh, support the work of our ministry? It's vitally important that we work from a, a strong understanding of what the estimate of giving is going to be from the congregation. So when we send out the cards that you're all familiar with in a few weeks and you return those cards, that information will provide the kind of information we need at the church council to make the wisest choices for next year's operating budget. Any other ideas that would help our congregation and its finances? I would like to recommend that everybody set up recurrent monthly giving online. Um, this is even more important for LUMC going forward. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, you can change it at any time if your family's needs change. And having a recurrent gift, um, pledging that recurrent gift actually helps us monitor our cash flow and be good stewards of the congregation's finances. Thanks, Leslie. That's a great idea. Um, are there things that are good news that we should be sharing with our congregation as we close out the year? Yes, I'd like to share a couple. First, according to our latest projections, it's very likely that we'll finish 2020 in the black. And I think this reflects the amazing support from our congregation. Mm. Secondly, giving towards our Greater Thing campaigns has remained strong. So we've been able to re-amortize our loan twice this year. That's amazing. And Steve, I'm pleased to say that because of the commitment and dedication of the congregation to its estimate of giving towards the Greater Things campaign, we've been able to reduce the indebtedness of the church by 18% in this fiscal year. Wow, 18%. Thanks be to God. Uh, I want to say thank you to all my friends for taking the time to be with us and share the information that we've shared. Uh, and I want to say thank you to our congregation for the ways you continue to support the work that we do. Um, in our next video, we'll be talking about how we've used 2020 to adapt to meet the ministry needs uh, to the congregation and the environment. And uh, thank you again for being with us this morning and God bless. As we enter into our time of offering today, we remember that letting go a portion of what God has blessed us with is a sacred transaction between our heart and God's. When we give an offering, it's our way of saying that I want others to be blessed by the God who has blessed me. Your financial gifts serve our community in numerous ways, and we are so thankful to have such a generous congregation. If you're joining us live on Sunday morning, we invite you to click on the Give tab at the top of your screen, or you can always go to our website and click the Give tab there as well. Let's pray over our offerings this morning. God of grace, we come to you today knowing that you have given so much to us, so much that you ask us to take care of. Help us to be good stewards of everything you've given us, of our time, our talents, ourselves, and especially our money. Please accept these offerings as our tokens of devotion to you and use them to do your work of justice and peace and both here in our community and throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen.
always, it has been such a treat to be with you this morning and help lead you in worship. I invite you, as always, to remember our uh, Wednesday Facebook devotionals. We post those Wednesday at 11 a.m. It's just a, a midweek way to check in and remember the Holy Spirit and to see how God might be guiding you in the middle of the week. Before we go today, I have a one invitation for you, and that is about our annual giving campaign. Uh, so I want to tell you to be on the lookout for a piece of mail coming to you in the next couple, couple of weeks that has some key information in it. First up in there, you'll receive a brochure that outlines this year's annual giving campaign and why it's so critical for our church in 2021. You'll also receive a letter from Pastor Steve with his thoughts on generosity and giving. And finally, you'll receive a card for you to turn in with your estimated giving amount for the next year. We're asking everyone to pray over that, to pray how God might be guiding you to use your resources next year. And then we'll ask you to turn in your estimated giving card before Sunday, November 22nd. I hope you all have an absolutely fantastic week. Have a happy Halloween. Now let's go to Pastor Steve for the benediction. Would you receive today's benediction? Beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And may the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God equip you with every resource needed to be Jesus' disciples. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory and honor now and forever. Amen.